kitchen folks, it's another experimental day in home brewing. I've picked some plums off the tree because they are starting to turn and um, yeah that one, they, they go green and then they go soft before they go properly purple which is a real shame but these are like as ripe as they could get before they go off so I need to do something with them. <laughs> So what I'm going to do with my plums is pop them in this saucepan and they do smell lovely and plummy. If you can hear a gurgling in the background it's this beast over here so don't be put off by it but moving over here back to the plums I'm just going to put the tap on a tad and put a small amount of water less than a centimetre in the bottom of the pan. I've got the pan on the back ring I'm going to put the gas on low and I'm going to let this come to a very gentle simmer and in doing that the plums will break down and then I'll be able to move to the next step. So I'll catch you in a bit when these have got to a simmer. Okay my plums have reached the simmer point so I've turned the heat off and I'm just going to leave them to cool for a bit. Steamy. Right so I'm going to get my plums out. I'm going to get my plums out. And I'm going to put them into this sieve just here, a few at a time. Nice and syrupy juice there, isn't there? So I'm just going to lift the sieve so you can see. But what I'm doing, I've got this wooden spatula and I'm going to push the plums around in the sieve and all the pulpy flesh will come through the sieve and the stalks and the stones will remain in the sieve. So I'm just going to do this for a minute until this one's done and then I'll show you what I've got. So that's the first sieve full done and what you'll notice is there's a lot of lovely plum juice underneath there and some flesh which has gone through but the bits that I don't want are left in the sieve. Now there's also some nice bits underneath the sieve so I need to make sure that I get hold of them. I'm simply going to scrape them off with the spatula and get them into the pan. Right, that's the first one done. I've got to do the rest of the plums. When I've done them all, I'll come back to you. Right, so here are my plums in the pan. So what I've essentially got is plum juice with some flesh. And this is all good stuff, full of flavour, great for fermenting. Next, I'd like to show you what I've got here. I've got my big deep saucepan, I've got a colander, and then I've got a colander sieve inside that colander with a muslin cloth. I'm now going to use that to separate the liquid from the solid with what I've got here. Now you can hear that dripping through and you can see it in there. Now this altogether is going to be a two day process. I'm going to allow the liquid to drip through for at least 24 hours. I want to get as much liquid out of that as I can. I will be left behind with a fruit matter cake, but that's fine. I'm going to do something else with that. What I want is the liquid. So at this point, I've got 500 grams of plums, which are now going through into here. Now, those of you that have watched my films before will be familiar with me using the sieve technique to separate the flesh and the pulpy stuff and the juice from the bits that I don't want. So I'm only showing you that for the plums in this film. Now this is a cider, so there needs to be apples, otherwise it ain't a cider. Here's my apples. Because what you've just seen me do with the plums, I've already done with two and a half kilos of apples. That two and a half kilos of apples are all windfall apples from my tree. They would have otherwise been thrown away because they were bruised and damaged, but by chopping them, steaming them, and pushing them through a sieve, they are now fine to use in brewing. So you've just watched me pour the plums into the muslin cloth. I'm now going to do exactly the same with the apples. And I'm going to fill this right up. And you can hear it dripping through. And I've got a bit left in the pan, so I'm going to let this sink down, and then I'm going to add the remainder. So there it goes, dripping through. The pink in the middle is the apple and the yellow on the outside is the plum. I'll come back to you in a little while when I've got everything into the muslin cloth. So I'll catch you in a bit. Okay, I've got everything in the pan now and it's just a case of playing the waiting game. 
I'll come back to you with an update tonight. We'll see how much it's gone down. Good morning from the kitchen, folks. It's actually about 36 hours later. Let's have a look at that apple and plum mush. And it's dehydrated somewhat, as in it's dripped through, but it's not been behaving itself. This should definitely have been much lower at this point, and there should be a depression in the middle where it's drained downwards. That hasn't happened. And what I suspect has happened is that the plum mush, which is much finer than the apple mush, has made a layer, like a sedimentary layer, on the muslin cloth and it's preventing anything getting through or it's really reducing the amount of stuff that's going through. I think that the plum mush should have gone in after the apple mush. That's my fault. I'm going to live with that mistake this time and I'll learn from it definitely uh, in future. So anyway, what I'm going to do for now is just take this off of here. There's nothing dripping. Pop it there. Let's have a look at what we've got. So there's a nice amount of juice here. I'm hoping after 36 hours it's not tainted. I'll have to have a little taste of it. But I'm just going to measure it to see how much there is there. So I've got a plastic measuring jug on the sink. And I'm just going to pour this very syrupy liquid into it. And in fact, it's filled the jug right up. And this is a two litre jug. So I've got two litres, which is... If this was going in a demijohn, that's just about half the amount. And I wasn't going to put this in a demijohn, I was going to use the Muntons wine fermenter, but now I'm thinking demijohn. So that's what I've got, and I was kind of expecting to get double the amount of that. And I think if this had behaved itself properly, I would certainly have got at least 50% more than what's there. So instead of fermenting with this, I think I'm going to ferment with the good old traditional demijohn. So I've just got a dessert spoon and I'm going to have a little taste of this. I want to make sure it's not vinegary. Uh, because it has been left for 36 hours exposed to air. It's slightly bitter, it's not vinegary, but the plum flavour comes through more than I expected. So that's a positive. So I'll now add this into my smaller big saucepan. I've got two big saucepans, a big big saucepan and a small big saucepan. This one holds about 8 litres, the other one goes to about 14 or 15. So I've just put the solids into here. There's a good couple of kilos of solids. This is going to be reused in cooking, either breads, flapjacks, jam sauces, whatever I decide to do with it. The liquid is in the pan, but before I go any further, let's have a look at all those key ingredients. So here are my key ingredients for this brew. So I'm beginning off with the apple and plum water, or syrup, I should call it, because it is very thick and syrupy. Moving on to 500 grams of dextrose monohydrate brewing sugar, two liters of spring water. I've got pectolase, because there will be a heck of a lot of pectic enzymes in there, and I'm hoping that this might help it to clear. I've got gervin, or gervin, however the heck you pronounce it, GV13 cider yeast. I want to say Jervin, like gin, or is it like git? I don't know. Like Ginsters. Ginsters or Ginsters? I say Ginsters. Do you say Ginsters? I don't. I'm calling it Jervin. Moving on. And I've got Young's yeast nutrient, uh, which will hopefully give it a little feed. I'm not adding any tea bags into this. I don't need them. The skins of the fruit will impart plenty of tannins and it's going to have a good bite. Right, let's crack on. So it's a fairly straightforward recipe. I've got two litres of liquid there and I'm going to add another litre, but I'm not going to add all of this. I'm just going to add half. The reason I'm not adding all of it is I don't want to make too much and then have more than fits in the demijohn. So I'm just being cautious because I can't think how much the 500 grams of brewing sugar is going to cause it to sort of expand in physical volume. I'm then going to add the brewing sugar, nice and straightforward. Then with a stainless steel spoon, I give it a right good stir. Okay, there's no sugar stuck to the bottom of the pan, so that's a good thing. 
now it's a case of putting the gas on woof, and turning it right down. I don't want to nuke this by any means, I don't want to fry it, I want it to come to a gentle pre-simmer. So I want this liquid to get up to between 80 and 90 degrees Celsius so it pasteurises the apple and plum juice that's there, gets rid of any baddies that might have got into it and then I'm going to leave it to cool. I'll come back to you when I'm at that pre-simmer. I'm going to move the pan to a cold ring and I'm going to put this on top to allow the steam to escape and the heat to dissipate. Hey folks, a few hours have passed. Let's have a look. And this is now warm rather than hot and it's okay now to get into the demijohn. So I've got my demijohn in the sink with a funnel in. It's all been cleaned and sanitised. So the first thing I'm going to do is put about half a litre of cold water into the demijohn just to protect the bottom of it. I don't think the liquid's too hot that's going to go in. I'm just being cautious. Then my sweet appley plum water is going on top. Very syrupy. Heavy syrup actually. So I've still got some space in the top there. I'm going to add a little bit more water. In fact, I might need to add another litre actually, looking at this. Yeah, I've got too much headspace in the damage on, so I'm just going to open uh, a big water back in a sec. So here's a big water. I'll be using this up this weekend anyway, but just get that in there. Now I'm going to fill the damage on too full, don't worry about that. Okay, here's the two full demijohn. I want to get a consistent mixture in there so it's the same gravity reading throughout in terms of how much water to sugar there is in the various parts of it. And I've got this very handy meat fork which just fits inside the demijohn and is long enough for me to give it a good stir around to ensure it's consistent. I want to take the original gravity of this, so there's my hydrometer tube. I'm just going to sacrifice 100 mil, that won't go back in. There we go. Now this is currently too warm for me to take the original gravity, so I'm going to put it in the fridge and I'll come back to it in about half an hour. Right, I need to get my dry ingredients in there now, so funnel goes in. I'm going to add a flat dessert spoon, well, kind of a semi-flat stroke minor rounded dessert spoon of pectolase. This is going to be very heavy in pectic enzymes so I'm trying to break those down. I want to follow that with the same amount of yeast nutrient. And now my yeast. The Gervin or Gervin GV13. So this is specifically labelled as cider yeast. And I'm going to do a little sort of Pour like so. So I've probably used about a third of the packet. Let's fold that over. That will definitely be useful for more ciders. And then I'm just going to give this a tiny bit of agitation, not too much, just to encourage that yeast to take a dive. Sometimes I don't bother, sometimes I do. I don't know if there's a right or a wrong way. Not really bothered. If it works, it works. And if it don't, it don't. Okay, so this is going to be very warm, very sweet, very nutritious and very delicious. So the yeast is, hopefully we're going to find the sugars and they're going to smash them apart to make some alcohol. A byproduct of which will be CO2. So in goes the airlock. This is my bendy airlock. What happens when you put a plastic airlock in a hot dishwasher? Still works though. So in goes the bendy airlock. And for now I'm done. I'm just waiting for the sample that's in the fridge to cool down so I can take the original gravity. So I'll come back to you in about 30 minutes time when it's time to do that. See you then. Okay, I've got my sample down to 20 degrees. Let's get the hydrometer in. And that's 20 degrees Celsius. And we're looking at a, a very nice original gravity for a decent side and not too rocket fuel, so that's good. Okay, it's 
borderline rocket fuel, but not quite. Uh, I'm going to start on an original gravity of 1.058, 1058. So at this point, I normally say, I'm going to come back to you in a few hours or tomorrow when fermentation has begun. It's already happened. Here we go. 1.058, we have the beginnings of a Krausen on top. We have some very delicate airlock activity, but undeniably there are bubbles coming through there. So at this point in time, I'm very happy with how it's going. I'll leave it for now and we'll come and have a look at it either tomorrow or in a few days time. Okay, catch you in a bit. Okay, apologies for the background noise, I've got Bob on duty, as you can see down there, but just moving around on brew day two to the plum cider, and we can see that fermentation is going like a Bobby Dazzler, fast and furious, all good here. We'll have an update in a little while. Tara from me, and Tara from Bob. from the kitchen folks it's brew day 16 for my plum cider and I'm bottling it what a turnaround let's have a look so here it is on the windowsill there is some haze it could be a pectin haze but there's also some sediment attached to the side of the glass throughout the demijohn I've noticed um, there's a distinct sediment line in the bottom and I'm going to bottle this not completely clear but I think it will clear up just fine in the bottle. Now, I will end up with a tiny bit of sediment in the bottom of each bottle. And I am talking about a couple of millimeter. I can live with that. I actually don't mind that at all. But I wanna get it out of the demijohn because I don't want it to sit for too long on the sediment as it is, because I think it might lead to off flavors. So let's crack on. So before I begin, I need to add some priming sugar into each of the bottles. So I'm gonna put about this much, which is just under um, a rounded teaspoonful. When the yeast which is left in suspension in the cider finds this bits of sugar, it'll break it apart, it will cause a fractional fermentation and CO2 will be created as a byproduct. That will build up pressure in the bottle and it's that pressure that will give it a sparkle, fingers crossed. So the bone comes out the siphoning tube goes in, I'm keeping it steady with this very handy clip and I'm going to push it so it's just above the sediment line but not in it. A couple of mils above will do, that's just fine. The first bit that comes out will be sediment heavy but it will go into the hydrometer tube. Right, let's get busy with the hopefully fizzy. So first bit's come out actually looking quite clear. 100ml in the hydrometer tube and straight into the first bottle. It's barreling out of there. Really good fast rate. I'm fairly confident I'll get a good sparkle off this one. I just hope it tastes okay. The plums can be bitter. Right, second bottle. I can see looking at this bottle here, look, there's already some reaction to that sugar. So that's going to be a good sign. Incidentally, the cider fermented for about 10, 11 days, and then it's just completely pretty much stopped. So I'm going for five full bottles. There's not enough here for six, but I do have an emergency pint glass which I can collect anything that's left over in and I'll enjoy that this evening. There we go so I've got my five full bottles and that pint glass should just about fill up. I could have gone for a smaller bottle but I didn't want to bother. And there we go that wasn't a bad guesstimate was it? So before I stick this in the fridge for tonight I might as well just have a little nifter in there. Not too dry. I would say somewhere in between medium dry and dry, but it's not too dry. It's got a good cidery flavour, but there's something else 
the smell doesn't actually um, give away the taste, which is unusual. The flavour. It's a bit more lemony than plummy, I would have said. Quite interesting, but it'll be good to see how the flavour develops as it conditions. Anyway, back to the job in hand. Here's bottle number one. I've got some plastic reusable bungs softening in hot water, makes them more malleable and it gives them a last quick clean. So I'm just shaking the excess water off, get it in the bottle, push it in. There we go. So the bung is nicely in place. Now, when that secondary fermentation takes place from the yeast, finding the sugar, smashing it apart, creating CO2, that builds up pressure, which gives this a sparkle. If I don't put a cage on this, that pressure will cause the bung to go Phew! So cage next. So I've got some brand new cages, actually. I've ordered these online from Amazon. I can't remember how much I paid, but they're inexpensive and they work three or four times. So I'm just going to give this a twist on top. Just using my fingers to twist it, but you can use a fork, which will save your fingers. There you go. So that is one bottle which is completely bunged and caged. I've got four more to do. I'll come back to you when I've done them. So that's all five bottles in the sink. I'm just going to give them a quick rinse, get the sticky residue off the outside. Right, I'm just going to leave the bottles to drain. And while they're draining, let's work out what the alcohol by volume is by taking a final gravity reading. So here's the sample and let the sample meet the hydrometer. And that sank very nicely. And I've finished on a final gravity of exactly 1.000. Okay, I'm going to work out the alcohol by volume for this brew. So I take the original gravity of 1.058. I deduct from that the final gravity of 1.000. That equals 0 0.058. I multiply this by 131.25 and that gives me a final ABV of, drumroll please, 7.6%. And I'm very happy with that. It's a good strength cider, but it's not rocket fuel. So while I'm waiting for these bottles to drain, I'm going to make the labels. Okay, I've got this Fomimo Bluetooth printer. It just connects to my iPhone. Make the label up very quickly and simply using the Fomimo app and now I tell it to print five copies. It's right posh. Okay, I'm going to label my bottles up. It's nice to make them look nice. It's good to know what you're drinking. There you go, one down, four to go. Be right back. And there they are, like five bottles of summer loveliness. Welcome to the living room, folks. This is where my plum cider is going to condition for the next month. And this is where it is up here. It's on top of my drinks cabinet. The temperature on the 1st of September is currently 22.4 degrees Celsius with no heating on. So it's plenty warm enough for it to condition. The conditioning process allows the yeast to find the sugar to cause that secondary fermentation to build up the sparkle within there and it also allows the flavour to develop. So I'm probably going to be looking at opening this either at the end of September or beginning of October. Catch you then. Good evening from the kitchen folks. It's the grand opening night for my plum cider. It's brew day 50 and I think it's conditioned and I think fermentation's happened. Let's have a look at the bung. I don't know if you can tell, but there is a distinct gap between the bottom of the bung and the top of the bottle of about two millimetres. So that's a good sign. The bung's being pushed out. That means that there should be some pressure inside. So fingers crossed, I'm going to get a sparkle. So what I want today is a nice taste. I want it to taste like I can actually taste some plum in it, if possible. Uh, I want it to be an all-round good cider. I don't want it to be too dry. I'd like it to be, if possible, medium dry or around about that ballpark. It's not too strong at 7.6%, so I've got a chance, but let's see. 
I don't mind dry incidentally, but with plum flavour I wouldn't mind it being a bit more of a medium dry. So I'm just getting the cage off. Right, am I going to get a pop? Yes! Oh, 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 what a beauty! Look at that! Proper vapour, rusher bubbles up the neck. Bobby Dazzler, right. Oh, yes. Oh, you beauty. Ripper. Oh, oh look at the colour of that. That is like sunshine and straw and gold and all sorts. Absolutely beautiful. Right, let's get that profile picture done. And now on for the serious business of the review. So it looks beautiful. I mean, I'm so pleased at the level of carbonation in there. The colour's great, the clarity's great. That's a, a cider that is, you know, to me, that's a really good looking cider. I love the colour, the, the yellowiness of it. Definitely can smell the plum. Now, whether I'll be able to taste it is another matter, but I can smell it and that's a great sign. So the plum and the apple. Yeah. That's interesting. It doesn't taste like it smells. There's a distinct plumminess on the smell. It just tastes like cider, but it's good cider. In terms of profile, It's in between dry and medium dry. It's on that side, it's on the dry side of the scale. I like it, it's a nice flavour, but I would never ever have guessed there was plum in it from the flavour of it. That said, it looks absolutely superb. I love the colour. <sighs> anyway, folks, it's been an absolute pleasure as always. Another cider down. I've got plenty more to open this season, don't you worry. There's loads. So I've really enjoyed the process of making it. I'm certainly going to enjoy the process of drinking it. So cheers to you. Thank you for supporting my channel. Please continue to watch my films, subscribe, hit like, all that stuff. Leave comments. It really helps the channel grow. That's how the analytics thing works. So any support is massively, massively appreciated. Thank you very, very much. And I'll catch you on the next brew. The film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the Home and Garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear. If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv. Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.